Hello and welcome to the Irish Collegiate Esports League of Legends Winter. My name is Obi Kane 9 and joining me tonight will be Nua Leoc for this best of two between the main youth crusaders and the TUD apes. Nua Leoc, how are you feeling about this series? I have no idea. <laughs> it's going to be pure chaos starting in this draft. These players have been playing everything under the sun. There's been roll swaps on both of these teams. It's all over the place. Uh, and honestly, I have no idea where we're going this evening, but I'm excited to find out with you. Yeah, I'm pretty interested in where both these teams are going. It seems both of them have been swapping roles and have players who can play pretty much anywhere. So it should be interesting to see if they do do any flex picks, especially with like the amount of players who play certain champions, what they can flex. As we do see the Vladimir banned away immediately against Madka's Vlad. Cause he is I think that's Vlad the one thing you do have to ban is Madka's Vlad. That's the one ban I was pretty sure of. The other ban I was pretty sure of was going to be Shen actually against TUD because Sub Doodly, who is, I'm pretty sure, the top lane for this team, uh, Plays a lot of Shen, and it's a pick that is quite strong. But hey, I'm immediately wrong. That's going to be a Mordekaiser locked in the top lane, and that's what he goes to. If it's not Shen, Sub Doodly will head straight towards those Berserry champs. Over on the other side, it's been Misha, and that is also a player who will pick up the Shen, or could pick up something like the Jax, the Seth, the Nara options that have been played so far in this tournament. So top lane looking to be Bruisers across the board. Yeah, I'm a bit surprised they just instantly picked the Mordekaiser, because they could have probably just left the bot lane here, given that they have taken the Ezreal, and they could have maybe even taken the Yumi with that, but uh, I guess they're just going to opt for maybe a strong Bruiser top lane. I think so. It's just, it's really hard to tell, and it's not even like Sub Doodly has been inflexible or really only has one pick that he's comfortable on. I mean, he's played a lot of champions so far. I think four unique champions already in this tournament, so... That is a weird early Mordekaiser lock-in. Maybe not one of showing their hand. The Mordekaiser is a relatively safe pick into a lot of top laners. And then for Maynooth, Clint just blocking in this Graves. Uh, he's played quite a lot of it so far this year uh, and looks good on it. And there is the Jax we were talking a little bit, uh, about a little bit. It's going to be an interesting matchup in this top lane. If either of these champions get rolling early, they could really start to dominate that top side of the map. Serious amount of AD taking for the main youth comp here. It'll be interesting to see how they're going to round it out because they're probably going to have to go for an AP Mage or AP Assassin for the middle lane. And I'm not too sure exactly what Deviant's playing, but maybe if he has an Akali or maybe Syndra in the back pocket wouldn't be too bad. There has been a Syndra. Uh, there's been one Syndra game for Deviant and it did not go well, <laughs> which is partly because he was up against Raheel in that mid lane. Raheel, one of the best mid laners in this tournament. So that was rough. And there is going to be the Syndra ban. I think the second ban for TD, if you're looking at these AP mid laners, is possibly the Silas. Uh, Again, Deviant had one game against Raheel on it and got a little bit put in the trash can. Uh, but I think that was Raheel diff more than it was any difference on the champion because Deviant then played a second game in their second series and absolutely popped off on that Silas. So Silas, while a little bit matchup dependent, could be quite good. And there's some decent ultimates still away here already. The Mordekaiser ult can be quite strong. Nunu ult can be decent. And Ezreal ult is also quite strong. So I think Silas is potentially the takeaway here if you are TUD. I will add that it was banned in the first phase of rotations, but they're going to opt to take away the Echo this time, which means they're going to have to opt for something a bit different. Maybe not the Annie, but another Control Mage going on here, because they do have a lot of engage with the Jax, with the Graves, and they do have a Jin as well, but I'm not too sure what they can round it out with. I don't know who that Echo ban was targeted at. <laughs> I don't know who on my new team plays that champion, other than Clint. Clint is the only person I know plays that champ, but Clint is playing Graves this game. So uh, that's an interesting Echo one. And as you say, we will see what the last couple of picks are here. TUD looking to pick up a support, looking to pick up a mid laner. Probably save mid lane to last pick if I was them. Try and counter pick whatever comes out in the mid lane. You're kind of expecting that AP champ over on the other side. You could pick up a strong support now. I mean, there's a lot of supports available there. Uh, of course, we still don't really know who's playing support for TUD. With the Alistair lock-in, I'm pretty sure that that's going to be Legendary playing support. That's at least one person locked in. Yeah, Alistair does help with their comp a bit here. It does provide a bit of disengage for the Ezreal, who already has his own self-peel. And it also helps a bit with the Nunu, because I think it's going to be pretty nice to make sure that this Ezreal stays alive in a lot of these team fights and he can do some serious amounts of damage. Yeah, and I think damage is the key word here, because TUD, Ezreal is really the only reliable damage they have right now. Mordekaiser can do damage, can kind of get on people, but it's quite dependent on getting on them. Jin does a good job of running away from Leona, makes it hard with the peel. Jax can kind of get away from a lot of stuff as well. So TUD need to lock in something quite high damage. With the Cassio P off the table, that's one big mid lane threat taken off the board that would have provided them with some good, consistent damage. So it's going to be kind of tough for TUD to find a champion in the mid lane that fits this. Maybe the Rise, they have had a couple of... But the problem was it was Legendary who was their Rise player. And Annie, the final lock in for Maynut. That's played a couple of times by Deviant, but I'm, I'm kind of surprised. I think for me, the Silas was probably a better pick here. 
I was joking about the A for Annie thing, but I kind of just have that to be a placeholder. But uh, yeah, we are going to see the Annie mid lane, and that that actually, to be fair, is going to help the comp a bit. A lot engaged, yep. especially with the flash, the Tabor stun. It got puffed as well because now the E gives movement speed, I believe, which was really handy to have, and it gives mm. a shield as well, which is really handy to have on something like the Jax that can just dive the backline to make sure this Ezreal doesn't get away. And well, it doesn't help that Tabor still also get the shield. It's it's nice. It's uh, the Annie is an interesting one, but I mean the excitement of the Annie pick is immediately overshadowed by the Heimerdinger pick over on the TUD side. <laughs> it got picked, and I can't even remember who played it. I was trying to go through TUD's games this tournament, and all of them are just role swapping all over the place. They're all playing different champions every time. They picked the Heimerdinger in what can only be described as a happy game in their last series, where they were playing Iron Jungle. They were playing Lulu bot lane as well. And so I was like, oh, we're not going to see the Heimerdinger tonight. That's fine. But hey, I was talking about consistent man magic damage threat. I was kind of saying there's not a lot of champions left there, but I guess Heimerdinger fits the brill pretty well for them. Yeah, I'm a bit interested in how it gauges with this comp here. Because right now, with the Heimerdinger lock in, it does seem quite solo QE. You do just have the <laughs> new new jungle with the Mordekaiser split push in top lane. <laughs> okay, sure. But I kind of like this comp from TUD. There's some good peel. Nunu peel with his ultimate is kind of incredible. Like, can you, trying to just run at these champions through Nunu ultimate with an Ezreal poking you down with a Heimerdinger turret in the way, Mordekaiser taking out the one threat that manages to get there, and then Alistair punting whoever gets there back out as well. Like, it is hard to engage on this back line from TUD. So if they can get to an objective first, they can con set up around it. They'll do a really good job of actually just controlling areas of the map. So Maynute, it's going to be all about proactive play for them in this early game. They need to be getting ahead on the map. They need to be forcing the issue, keeping TUD on the back foot. Because as soon as they fall behind, as soon as they're being beaten to objectives, they're going to start hemorrhaging those across the map. Yeah, this should be, all in all, a really good game. Because I think so far, Minute's comp does look very nice for the team fight, and I think does come together well at the 5v5 and these early skirmishes. But I think TUD do have quite a bit of snowball in their comp with the Mordekaiser and Ezreal, and even the Heimerdinger. Yeah. Uh, we'll see for many. I, I think they're the team that really does need to start this snowball going, that needs to keep their damage ahead of the curve, because the other side as well is going to be so tanky. That classic Ezreal build, of picking up the uh, the death stance as you go, could even go potentially for the Iceborne Gauntlet this game with so much heavy AD diving on top of them. Uh, and then the Heimerdinger with just throwing down his onions as well. If you're not ahead enough to burst these champions out, if they start getting their tankiness rolling, uh, Maynooth are going to struggle to burst them down in the mid game. We're going to struggle as the game goes long to actually find the kills in big skirmishes. Uh, and I think TUD, if this game starts to go late, will probably have an edge in, in the 5v5s, actually. Yeah, it's going to be a pretty interesting one anyway, to be sure, especially with their ranks being relatively similar. And it should be a pretty interesting comp to see where it goes with it. Maybe no one sided stomp or anything. Definitely. Um... There is, as you were saying as well, the Jax is a bit of a split push threat. The Mordekaiser can hold him for a while, but eventually Jax will just manage to outscale Mordekaiser. So if the game does go late, and I know we're talking about this a lot, but also a lot of these games, when you're talking about players who don't necessarily play in competitive settings a lot of the time, kind of get stalled out relatively effectively uh, and, and kind of end up going quite long. This Jax will outscale in the sideline quite hard. So that's the one thing to be very aware of if you are TUD, is that this Jax will become a threat relatively uh, relatively quickly as the game goes along. Yeah, and I think with the Annie buffing up as well with the shield and movement speed, this buff, this patch, it might be really handy for him to just dive back, especially Heimerdinger that's pretty immobile, and especially with the Ezreal, which can kind of force the E out, but they do have the Alistair to disengage, and they do have the Nunu, so it should be yeah. interesting. So that's it. We are, we are looking for picks in the mid-game from Minute. We're looking for TUD to stall it out, control objectives, and just keep the map well lit up. It's going to be a lot on this Alistair and the Nunu to work together, keep those wards down around objectives. Uh, and with that, we are going to head to a quick three-minute break uh, as we wait for these teams to load onto the Rift, and we will see you back here after that.
Welcome back to game number one of this best of two, well, best of two, two games between MU Crusaders and TUD Apes as we get ready to launch into this one. Both teams about to hit the rift. Uh, as I'm looking for level one shenanigans, I really do want to see one of these teams try and pull something off, especially MU Crusaders, who I do think need to get a little bit ahead as we start. Yeah, this should be an interesting game. I was kind of thinking that, like, both of these comps kind of go along together well, and I'm actually interested to see. You see the Heimerdinger opting to go for the TP. Do see the TP as well onto the Annie, which I thought she'd offer the Ignite, but I'm not too sure myself. Okay, as we are seeing what these teams do. Uh, at this level, not much happening uh, to start this one off. Yep, yeah. and we do see right now that level one, they're just going to offer something safe, five man spreads each on either side here. And Nunu is going to stop top, top, top side, and the Graves is going to start top side as well. So they're both going to opt for probably level three ganks. Yeah, that does seem pretty likely at this point. Uh, this mid lane is a tough one. The Heimerdinger will have pushed, but there's not much the Graves can do to actually get them uh, out of the way. Once the Heimerdinger gets the push on, once those turrets are down, it becomes really hard to gank that lane. <laughs> you can't do a huge amount about it if you are that jungler. And Summoner Bobby also not really going to be looking that way, that, into that lane once it is pushed forward. So as you say, bot lane, probably the focus for these junglers as we head into this game. Yeah, and I'm interested to see right now in the bot lane matchup anyway, because early levels anyway, Alistair, Ezreal shouldn't be really able to do as much as Jin Leona, especially at levels 3 to 6. But around that level 6 time, Alistair and Ezreal kind of come a bit more online, a bit more all in, a lot more poke coming through for either. So it'll be interested to see exactly how these trades go. It definitely will be. The, lane, the push already in favor of Perfect Anomaly and Nile in that bot lane. So they will be looking for Summoner Bobby in his jungle. They're going to find him on his Gromp. Uh, word goes down, they know exactly where the Nunu is and just going to back back out. So that's the advantage of the early push. Now Clinto can farm his jungle in a bit of peace, knowing that the enemy jungler is not invading, the Nunu's not doing anything silly trying to get these camps down early on. Yeah, and we do see the bot lane already opting to go pretty far to get a deep ward in on the Nunu's jungle, but they are going to get spotted. But overall, I think just with the way pushed into them, they can just afford to just put these extra wards down and give that extra vision to the Graves, who can probably do a bit more bits early. Yeah. Uh, and this Graves definitely does do quite well if you can get a bit of gold, get some lethality going. Uh, there's going to be a lot of armor built up on the other side, so that lethality Graves that is the optimal build a lot of the time at the moment is not going to feel as strong for Clinto in this game. Yeah, and meanwhile mid lane just going to do a lot of harass down there. That's just the Annie coming in clutch there. She did opt to go for the Electrocute, which there is some runes they can go, but mm -hmm. she's going to go for that one. As a gank is going to come in onto Deviant here from Madcliffe Fad. Annie does have the flash available to her, but it hasn't popped it just yet. Taken super low. I think she might just concede the kill, but no, she flash stuns and does get out of there. While Clinto coming in to try and clean something up back here for Maynooth. And nothing's going to go down fairly, and both of them are going to get out alive. The interesting gank strategy from both teams there. Hey, I said the mid lane was, wasn't going to be ganked, I said it was going to be tough, but Heimer didn't really get the push early on. Madkus Vlad choosing not to push this lane. You can see the turrets are actually very far back. He's happy to let this wave push in, and that did allow the setup for Summoner Bobby to come in, try and get that gank off. But Clinto, in a good position for the counter gank, came in, uh, and the turrets, again, just weren't in a position to really turn that one around. So, a couple of flashes blown, but nothing really gained by either side there other than that, unless we can get a good repeat counter gank from Summoner Bobby. Really nice hold of the flash from Deviant there, because at the time when they kind of thought that he conceded the lane earlier on, so when he had the W available and did have the stun and he managed to hit it onto Mad because Vlad, he, like holding that flash for late enough was just enough to get away, because I thought instantly he was going down there. Yeah, I thought so too. But... Hey, he didn't. Uh, Clinto nearly finds the recall on Mad because Vlad there, but didn't quite manage to at the end. And I mean, this trading up in the top lane as well, like it's, it's not going to come to much right now, but as this game goes long, Jax will start to look a little bit better against Mordekaiser. And if you can get that rolling early, you're looking really strong. 
Yeah, both TP's available to the top laner as Clinto is going to come in here with the smoke screen, trying to do a bit of damage in a subdued league cube. Both sides going to connect, but nothing's going to actually pick up. Yeah, and that's a good little attempt by Clinto. You know, saw an opportunity there. Uh, damage on both sides meant Sub Doodly was looking a little bit low, but not much going to come of that one. Uh, as we do see Summoner Bobby is heading up towards this top side as well, just in case of any repeated gank attempts. But Clinto is already backed all the way out and not much doing up on that top side for the time being. Yeah, and Karen right now bot lane still going in the favor of Maynooth here. Perfect Anomaly and Nile just having some serious push down on this Ezreal Alistair, which I don't think is strong enough to really contest anything right now. No, definitely not. This Ezreal is going to want to just sit back, scale. That's the, the one thing we are seeing with this Maynooth comp is there is only two real big damage threats. I mean, sure, Mordekaiser is quote unquote a damage threat as well. <laughs> But you're not looking at this Mordekaiser to just kind of solo carry fights unless something goes really awry in this game. Unless this Mordekaiser is picking up big kills early on. Uh, you're really looking at Heimerding and Ezreal to carry the fights in the mid-game as the game goes longer. So, Mad Kills Vlad and Icornetto just happy to sit back, pick up farms, start to scale, get those core items in. Uh, and be in a good position for when these dragon fights start kicking off around the 20-minute mark. Yeah, and you see both junglers pathing towards that bot side. Bit of an unfortunate gank attempt from Summoner Bobby, but he doesn't lose too much out of it. And he does path towards this, where his first dragon of the game will be the Mountain, which I'm... Seems just a nice dragon overall on both teams. Tanky for a bit of Jax, especially onto the Mordekaiser as well. So I'm not sure if they're who's going to try and go for this early. It's it's kind of a tough one for both of them, because both junglers do have decent ways to steal. You know, the Graves on the blue side can get over that back wall if he finds Nunu on it. But then, obviously, it's very hard to smite a Nunu who has <laughs> smite and can, uh, can see him. What's the name? Can see him, yeah. Is it can see him? Yeah, see, I knew I was right. But we will see, you know, the, the Graves will try for this one. But again, yeah, it's risky. Nunu can just roll in and steal this one if he is in the area. But good job by the blue side to recognize that Nunu is not in the area. will be rotating up towards that red buff that's spawning uh, and choosing not to go for it. Yeah, they're going to concede it over to blue team, which kind of makes sense considering Maynooth did have bot prior the entire time. And there really isn't too much they could do without maybe losing a plating. Yeah, uh, absolutely. But this will mean Ezreal is getting a bit of farming under terror, as Legend Jerry will be found out in the jungle. Forced to flash out of there. Ignite does come down from Nile, but a really nice E to connect in there. And they do pick up the kill for Clinto. They're really nice. And I think over that, they just get first blood, get first dragon, and that's a really nice start to this game. I mean, getting free farm on your Ezreal is definitely not worth your <laughs> giving over first blood to the Graves in the jungle. Uh, saying it was going to be a bit of a tough game for, Gra game for Graves is never mind, there's more fighting in the top there lane. Is Jax does find himself between a rock and a hard place here as Summoner Bobby and Sub Doodly going to take him down there with the kill going onto the Mordekaiser, who has opted to go for the Bramble Vest first item to make sure he doesn't get any of the healing off here with that bilge. Yeah, that's nice. Uh, Bramble Vest just does so well against any champion who wants to auto attack. And we were saying this Mordekaiser won't really be a damage threat or won't be one of the main carries in these team fights unless something goes seriously wrong. And that seriously wrong could be getting another kill if Sub Doodly can continue to put this pressure down, can start snowballing against Misha. Not only does it delay when the Jax will be able to get ahead in this game, not only does it delay when that split pushing threat becomes viable, it will allow the Mordekaiser to really pose a threat to the backline of TUDH. And that could be a big deal. As we do see Misha potentially oh, getting no. caught out again there by Summoner Bobby, but he does manage to get away. And um, it's looking a bit rough here for the Jax early, but the Graves is passing bot side. The E does connect onto the Ballastar as it doesn't have six available yet. They are both sides of the queue going to hit and perfect anomaly. Going to pick himself up a kill onto Legendary. Yeah, I mean, that's just a little bit over aggressive. This Ezreal and this Alistair pushing a little bit too far forward in the lane, and that's Legendary dying a second time, just from getting caught out in places that he didn't necessarily need to be, not respecting Clinto being in the area. And Clinto now starting to look pretty good on the screen, being pretty comfortable, uh, as he's getting a bit of gold and will have those items ahead of the curve. Yeah, and it's also known that Sub Doodly does have TP advantage currently over Misha, so he could opt to go towards bot lane when this dragon is coming up in the next three minutes, whereas Misha doesn't have it available for anything, especially now in the Jax where he's a kill down. Yeah, I mean, I guess the question is if you actually want to fight over this next Drake. <laughs> I mean, it is, it's Infernal, which is nice, but, you know, you're also on this patch, I think. Uh, we saw it a lot from G2 Worlds, and I know, look, they're out now. It's a, sore, it's a sore point for all of us. <laughs> but we saw, like, you, you can be fine giving up a couple of drakes if you think you're going to be a better point to fight over the other ones later. You, you can give up those early fights and not risk anything. And I think that is definitely a viable play for MU Crusaders right here. They can just afford to give up a couple of drakes because this is a comp that's really happy fighting around drakes and barons as the game goes longer if they can find the setup once they have their items. Yeah, and we do see Deviant getting 
poked out there by the Heimerdinger returns, doing a lot of damage. As I think right now, Deviant can't really do too much because he just gets poked out of every wave he takes. So unless he gets the Tibbers or a Flash ulti or maybe a little more help from Clinto, it might just be a rough laning phase. It's been a little bit surprising to me not to see Mad Lad pushed in a lot harder in this laning phase. I mean, the turrets definitely do give you a lot of poke. The mana has been high. You know, he could be he could be doing more to push this wave in. So it's definitely a choice rather than how this lane naturally has to play out. Uh, as Madko's lad has just been maybe aware of Clinto's position, you know, aware of the gank possibility and not wanting to have this lane pushed up too far so he does, can't get caught out. Yeah, we do see the Graves is hovering around topside for that Rift Herald and Summoner Bobby can't really help here, especially with the top, top laner in the current state that it's in right now with Misha having the Pryo. I think this is just going to go straight over to Blue Team. As, I mean, in this early game, Clinto just doing a lot more for his team than Summoner Bobby has been. Uh, that's two objectives now, the Mountain and the Rift Herald both secured. It's a couple of kills, but we'll see Summoner Bobby trying to get something back on the bottom side when Direct Cam gets down there. And he does hit the ulti down, and we do see the absolute here going to hit from the Nunu, but we do see the Solar Flare connecting onto Nile, not flashing out of the Shrine to stay alive. Ignite coming down, Ezreal ulti not going to hit him, and unfortunately it looks like no one gets a kill out of that. Yeah, I mean, this is it. It's Sumner Bobby's ganks just not quite working out. The Graves has done more on the ganks, has done more on the objectives. And uh, well, on, on the one hand, the Graves needs to do a little bit more, needs to get more gold, needs to get ahead, because if you don't have the damage, you're just not doing anything as Graves. New New Absolute Zero is still a good peel till in the mid game. But Sumner Bobby, I think, would want to be securing more of those neutral objectives. You're playing Nunu. It's so easy. And we do see a pretty good bait here, but Subdoodly does pop the Mordekaiser ulti to try and stay away from this as Misha is taking super low. Forced to flash. It's going to take a lot of damage from this passive and is going to go down, but we do see Clinto outside the ulti as Directed Cam puts us away, puts us back in here. And Clinto trying to get away with his life, but oh. Subdoodly might just get this. And he does get the pull, just get the Q, and he gets the kill back response. But bot lane, Anomaly going to pick himself up a kill onto Legendary. What did I say? Just don't let the Mordecai to get rolling. Keep the two damage threats as Ezreal and Heimerdinger so you don't have to worry too much about this Mord. And that. Nah. nah, nah, nah. They're just going to run up there and hand over two kills in the 1v2. So absolutely coming up huge. You get all of the stats or a percentage of the stats from your opponent after they die in the death realm. And Clinto just not expecting it. Not expecting the tankiness and damage that came out. And that was a... Uh, that's a lot for so absolutely. Sub Summoner Bobby may have had a really poor gank. Here's the Solar Flare going oh, to hit no. Subdoodly and Summoner Bobby, and Subdoodly might have just wasted his TP here. It's taken quite low. Perfect Anomaly is a bit strong right now, whereas the members of Red Team are going to connect. They aren't going to get Anomaly back here, I think, and it might have just been a waste of gank. And mid lane now just leaving the lane for nothing, really. Oh, we do see the Flash knock of not going to get the kill, unfortunately, as the E does connect. On to the Alistair, Legendary going to go down for a fourth time. Meanwhile, Clinto has arrived and he is going to try and take some Doodly down. Ikernetta and Vladimir are the only two to get out alive. Pretty, pretty rough <laughs> if you are at the side of MU Crusaders. They wanted that to go well. They, they kind of needed that to go well because not only did the few more kills go over, all of a sudden this Jax is split pushing on the top side, has gotten a lot of gold. Like, I mean, this 0 2 0 Jax is now proxy farming between your towers and you hate to see that with the Jacks getting back into this game, getting back into this lane, and shutdown goals going over from Subdoodly as well. Yeah, meanwhile Misha trying to get these platings in the top lane, and he is going to get two, but yeah, it was a bit unfortunate fight, and I think my news really just... They turned a fight that I didn't think would go too well for them, and flipped it, and managed to get a couple of kills out of it, especially onto the Jin, who went for first item Storm Razor, which... I'm not sure every Jin does it, but I know some do. But it's still a pretty good item to have to slow these Pimbers. Yeah, I think up against the team he's up against, where there's slippery people uh, that you're just trying to keep in range to get a little bit more damage on, especially the Ezreal. It's okay. Uh, I still think just the IE gives you so much value as the Jin, but that's probably just worth going first. I mean, you're basically guaranteed a crit on your fourth shot no matter what, so... Uh... We'll see. Uh, I mean, I'm assuming he still gets the, the regular Jin items in there at some point. This isn't going to suddenly turn into a Murmana Jin after a first item Storm Razor or something. But I mean, I guess it is perfect anomaly, so you never really know. <laughs> yeah, and uh, looking at some of these player standings, we do see Legendary currently 0-4 now, which means like four of the kills that are currently sitting on my news are just from him alone, which probably aren't as valuable as the three in response that Subdoodly has. Although I'm not sure what he can do with those right now into this comp. Yeah, uh, and I mean, for Legendary, like, 
Alistair's going to be Alistair come the mid game, no matter what. All, his, his entire job is just to keep people off this backline, keep people away from Ezreal and Heimerdinger. If the Jax gets in there, if the Grave gets in there, try and do it. Or at least, you know, position in a way that Annie can't just flash onto your backline as well. That's something that we I really do want to see come this mid game because this Annie just trying to get on people is going to decide whether or not these skirmishes work out into EDH's favor a lot of the time. Uh, so Legendary needs to be shadowing Ward and keeping Annie off the flanks. I don't yeah. think he's gonna do it, kinda no matter what his scoreline is. Like, as long as he's not all the way behind the curve, as long as he's literally not getting one shot by the Annie just for walking up from a queue, then he's gonna be a little bit okay. And we do see, gonna go back here, Nunu not going to opt for the gank here, as we do see most of the gold currently going to be sitting on Clinto, who is absolutely tearing up this game. He's ganking everywhere. <laughs> Clinto's having a huge game so far, uh, and this is what you kind of need to see uh, from the Graves. And against a comp that is, you know, I've said it before, but this is a comp that's going to be building up a huge amount of armor. It's going to get a lot of resists. Uh, and as the Graves, when you want to be building these lethality items, the fact that you are this far ahead of the curve against a comp with so much armor is really important because it means his damage will be relevant for that much longer into the game. Uh, and he will actually be able to do things in these fights that aren't just run in, throw a smoke screen down, and hope that it blocks most auto attacks that your team does well. I'm interested in the top lane matchup right now, because we do see the Blade of the Rune Kings completed for Misha here, but we haven't seen the completed Leandri's Torment just yet. So I'm not sure who wins this 1v1 trade if Mordekaiser doesn't get his recall off. I think it, it's got to be the Mordekaiser. With the Ninja Tabby and the Bramble Death as well, Misha is just going to have such a rough time of it, even with Clinto up here. I mean, well, we've seen the 1v2 once already, and I'm not sure some dude can't do it again, to be honest. Maybe, actually, to be fair. They are going to go a bit forward here, but I don't think they're going to opt for a dive. Heimerdinger did think maybe he might be able to get something off in return, but he is going to leave it, or as Annie is also hovering around for this dragon. I'm not sure if they're being pretty indecisive so far. Yeah, 3v3 on the bot side, uh, but nothing's going to come out. <laughs> Some dude favoring himself, he's going! He's going forward here for Clinto, and he does get taken very low as both sides of the queue are going to hit Sub Doodly. Sub Doodly forced to try and flash, but Misha does pick up the kill, and that might just be the top turret. Sub Doodly feeling himself a little bit too much there, and that's rough. This Mordekaiser got off to such a good start. It looked like the Jack split push just wasn't happening this game until at least kind of 30, 40 minutes in. And all of a sudden, with first terror picked up with a farm lead for Misha as well, this split push is a much realer threat. And we said that's one of their win conditions if they can't get far enough ahead on other parts of the map. So big deal here for the Jacks. Yeah, that Jack's getting a bit of gold is so much handier. He is also sitting on a 10 CS lead, which I would have assumed it might have been a bit tougher for him to get, especially into an early bruiser like Mordecai, so he could probably punish that. I really was that TP down to the bot lane, but Subdooly didn't get anything off and died for. Uh, that that was the big punish moment for MU in this game. And honestly, I think if we were looking back at this game afterwards and it does turn out the TUD win this game, I, you probably do look at that bot fight with the TP invested as the real turning point. Yeah, second dragon is going to go over to main news though. Going to be the infernal, but we do see an ocean soul going to spawn in 25 seconds here. Not too sure whether which team uses it better, really, to be honest. But I think I'm main just happy with it. <laughs> main Uther, main Uther very happy with it. MU's comp with that ocean soul would be disgusting. That's look, that's a dead Heimerdinger. Uh, <laughs> no Zanyas yet. You just die if you get locked down at all. And honestly, you would have died even if you had the stop after the Zanyas. It was just burst too quickly, but. I mean, this MU comp with how how much health they're all going to be building as well, it's just going to be absolutely filthy if they can get their hands on the ocean. So, honestly, though, with the game, the way the game is looking with the control Clint's had over these dragons, it does not look like MU will get a sniff of a drake in this game. Yeah, TUD are really on the back foot here as Minuther just seem to be winning every lane because bot lane hasn't even been on the center stage of this game, and Anomaly is just 4 0 3 and already has the Executioner's Calling and is setting up to get himself an Infinity Edge next. He'll be a monster as well. Uh, he, he absolutely will be. Uh, the Executioner is a nice choice up against the Nunu, up against the Mordekaiser, even the Ezreal. Like, there's a lot of healing in small places uh, across the enemy comp, so I'm glad to see that come out. Uh, as we do see gold graphs coming up one more time, and that is perfect anomaly. Just through farming, just through getting a couple more kills, has closed the gold gap to Clinto, nearly tied for most gold on the team. You can see it. gold values across the board just that much higher for TUD apes. They are feeling very comfortable in this game at the moment. Yeah, Minuther is super far ahead right now, and I think, in part, having the jungle and having the bot lane so far ahead is just really good to have, because when you're reliant on getting your top lane to push ahead and reliant on getting this Ezreal to survive most team fights, and your bot's that far behind, behind, it's really tough for you to come back into this and take these fights later on, especially these early skirmishes, as we've seen three dragons already go over to Minuther. 
definitely will be as this is. <laughs> Leona, Leona does have nice the gin on w. the way. A nice W yeah. did connect up from the gin onto him to actually stop that as well. Nice solar flare usage. Yeah, that, that was that was nice. And it's mad because Vlad just overextending a little bit, getting a little bit desperate for this farm. The EV is in a little bit of a rough spot right now. Yeah, the jungler is going to be having top side as the Baron Nashua are going to be spawning in five seconds. I'm interested to see who's going to be taking this one. Maybe Clinto might look for a really, really cheeky Baron. I guess it's possible. They don't have the best Baron taking team in the world. And by that, I mean they have a terrible Baron taking team. <laughs> but I guess you can use Tibbers to tank for you. That's probably the one real bright side. But Jin not the best. Graves is okay. Jax is pretty good at it as well. Uh, but other than that, you know, really the side that if they were ahead could be trying to sneak Barons is to you the Apes with the Heimerdinger and the Ezreal. Uh, even the Mordekaiser is okay at that, but, you know, they're far enough behind that I don't think there's any risk of them trying to sneak in there anytime soon. I do think Glinto and Misha are probably caught between all five members of TUD here. They're going to go forward. I think they're trying to commit for this. The Death Realm is going to get popped onto Clinto. Clinto going to try and 1v1 sub Doodly in here. Going to do a bit of damage. Doesn't have the collateral damage no. available to him. And we do see sub Doodly going down. Niall getting the kill. Flash force from Deviant here, and Malkos Vad forced to flash out of it from the Tibbers damage. He's oh, no. going to go down. Icronetto and the rest of the members might not be longing for this world any longer as well, as Perfect Anomaly is just destroying people here. Legend Jerry is pretty low, is going to go down. It's going to be a double kill as the curtain call, not going to catch the Ezreal. And I think the only survivor of this will be Icronetto. Oh, that's rough. It looked okay for TUD, but not even able to get one kill. Deviant's <laughs> in the base. <laughs> yeah, you hate to see it. That's the last kill coming down. Perfect knowledge, you'll pick it up. And honestly, Icronetto played that fight out about as well as can be expected, given how big the goal differences were in that. Nearly managed to pick off two or three members at different points, but all five stay alive for a minute. They take down the min mid in hip tower. They take down the top inner tower, and they're just snowballing this gold lead out of control. I tell a lot. They haven't taken down the top inner yet, but they're having a go at it. Yeah, I uh, don't know if you saw that Annie committing the TP there to pick up the kill on Tycurnetto. It was pretty no. quality. Just Annie inside the base. Um, like, I mean, look, that's it. You love to see it. They're playing with aggression. They're playing. They know they have the gold lead. They know they have control of the game. And this is the time now. We'll see them back out, get their resets in. Everyone has gold spend after that fight. Uh, vision control being gained around this Baron. And either, I mean, you have the choice. You can group mid. You're strong enough that you can just force down this mid inhib and then look back off the Baron. Or if they want, they can group up around this Baron now and try and force that one down. Like, there, there are choices here for Manus, and honestly, I think both of them are kind of viable. Yeah, and I think looking at the bot side of the map here, Perfect Anomaly currently 804 has the Infinity Edge, Storm Razor, and an extra 20% crit chance. Meanwhile, Clinto going to get caught out here by Malkus Fad, forcing the flash, trying to E out of there. Not enough, and I think Niall got there a little bit too late to do anything. Okay, that's big. Icronetto has really been the shining light so far for this TUD Apes team. Has been, you know, doing the most damage in these fights. A little bit unsurprisingly, given that he's he's picking up this gold in the sidelines. Uh, but playing these fights out really well and getting that shutdown means that he's a chance. The perfect anomaly is just looking to chase Mordekaiser down and sub doodly. Still does damage, still did a good start to this game, but having a rough time of it after what looked so promising early on. Do you see the curtain call coming out from the Jin here? And he's going to do probably a fair chunk. I do think that Storm Razor is coming in super handy for the split push Jin, where every auto is just going to slow him. Ooh, eyes on Deviant coming up from the mid lane. This could be sub -doodly dead if he stays too long. The I think he doesn't know he's he there. Vent, and he flashed on Perfect Anomaly to dodge the Aniel. He's going oh, for it. Oh, he flashed Death Realm, so he's not going to be able to get in time. And he does get the stun, though. sub -doodly not going to be able to move in time. And I think he's going to get out of the not Mordecai's realty. Oh. He is. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I hate to see it. I, it was the only play left to sub Doodly was Flash Death Realm because once the Annie arrives into that lane, the stun lands and you're just dead from there. Uh, so made a go of it and unfortunately just couldn't quite get the damage down at this point. Uh, no no Quicksilver Sash is picked up just yet on the side of Maynooth, which is maybe a little bit greedy given how strongly the Mordekaiser started, the, given the chance that he can still 1v1 a lot of these people in the Death Realm. But hey, they're just better out playing him. That's all that matters at the moment. It's actually insane some of the stuff that's going on in the fight. Like the fact that Annie got up there in time, especially the fact that she was able to shield Perfect Anomaly to barely get out of that after your subduedly having the Leandri's yeah. procs. That really little clutch. bit of magic resist coming in from the shield, saving saving sub to Perfect Anomaly from the Leandri's is pretty tasty. As now they will attempt steals, and this is an early Ocean Soul that's just been given up. They haven't contested for a single one of these drakes. TUD haven't been in position to contest for any of these drakes, and they're just getting found out in their jungle. Sumner Bobby, he's he's just. 
dead. Yeah, he is gonna go down there. Doesn't even bother trying down the absolute zero. As we see Divi going forward here as he upgraded turret, trying to do as much as he can, but not gonna get anyone. Ezreal is gonna go down there. So is the Heimerdinger as flashes are blown. And Clinto is trying to pick up this kill onto Legendary to maybe just end this game here with the Dragon Soul. We do see Legendary going golden, will eventually go down here. Niall going to pick himself up a kill there. They're gonna go for the inhibitor, and I maybe think this is game. They have a chance here. They definitely have the minion wave. It's only Sub Doodly left alive. Death Realm isn't even available, so it'll be a 1v5 defense. Sub Doodly, it'll take a bit of magic. Yeah, they're just chunking in this turret. The Jax E is going to connect onto the Mordekaiser. Sub Doodly does get taken down. Only Summoner Bobby left, and that maybe will be the end of this game. Oh, that will be the end of this game. It's a little bit. Oh, the rough one is it the end? Yeah, it's the end. It I, is. Yeah. Okay, oh. it's the end. Okay. <laughs> After a scrappy ending, it looks like Maynou finally get themselves up that kill. That's going to be the game one. find the 1-0, one and what happened in this game was TUD Apes let Maynou play the style that their comp needed to play. TUD Apes, that was a comp they wanted to play it slow, they wanted to get vision around objectives, and they wanted to play slow in areas that they controlled. And Maynooth just never let them have it. They were up in their faces, they were getting picks, they were fighting them in the jungle, 1v1, 2v2, 3v3. And in the end, it is Maynooth University who come out with the victory off the back of playing to their win conditions. Yeah, I think in general, every lane, I think so far, bar top lane, ended up winning that. And I think there was just nothing at the start of that the TUD could actually do after about 10 minutes. Yeah, and I mean, even top lane, Clinto showed up and uh, swung that back into his top laner's favor after not too long of the time spent at the deficit. So, big game from everyone, especially Clinto, I think, played absolutely beautifully in game number one there. Uh, and we'll have to see adjustments to be made in the draft for TUD Apes in game number two.
Welcome back to game two of this best of two series in the League Irish Creature Esports League of Legends Winter. I'm still Obi Kinnan and with me is hopefully still Newell Eoch. Welcome to this one. What do you think? I'm good. Haven't killed over between games. <laughs> still looking forward to game number two here. And I think we need to see big, big switch ups by TUD. They drafted a comp that could have worked in game number one, but it was a comp that needed to play a lot more slower, a lot more controlled than they chose to play at the game. They knew it kind of got to dictate the pace once they got a little bit ahead. Uh, and so it's on TUD to either pick something that can play into that style a little bit better, or if they're going to try and do something similar again, if they're going to go for a similar style of comp, they need to really do a much better job of controlling the game once they get there. Yeah, looking at the bands this time, we aren't going to see anything that we saw last game and i think they're just going to swap it up but not necessarily ban away the graves or even the gin that was pretty prevalent instead main news are going to ban themselves mm, and for tud i mean it's tough there's not many of these picks that they can take away the graves was such a big power pick for clint in that last game and unfortunately there's nobody on tud who can actually play that one so they're going to pick away the first as the the ezreal first and honestly icronetto looked good on it last game but wasn't really having a solo carry performance wasn't really looking in danger of taking over the game at any point so i'm not entirely sure about that first pick ezreal and we'll have to see how it does for icronetto this time around yeah they're gonna see that countered back here with the Senna, which I quite like because it does offer a bit of poke. It's very safe and it does have a lot of healing and ways of keeping your team alive with the Dawning Shadow as well. Although looking at TUD right now, they do have the option to opt for the Lumi right now because if they go for Ezreal Yumi, that's a much better bot lane than they've had before. And I reckon it probably helps have Icronetta just playing extra safe and have the Yumi ulti available. It is. I guess the question just becomes who actually plays Yumi on the TUD ape side because, I mean, there's so many people who play so many different things, and I have no idea. I mean, somewhere in there, they've got to have a Yumi player, right? Yeah, you just chop their jungler to top, put their top to AD, and put their AD to mid lane. And then Icornetto is just playing Ezreal jungle somehow at the end of all of this. <laughs> Instead, it's going to be Sejuani picked up, and uh, I think that was Bobby's other pick. It was the one pick he picked that wasn't really an AP champion in the jungle before this series. The Nunu was another new pick for this team, but the Sejuani, going back to something that's been played before, and it's definitely an easier tank jungle to execute on than that Nunu. So a little bit more safety for TUD already, and then the Nautilus, uh, uh, also an easier kind of engaged champ, an easier peel champ than the Alistair was. So already this TUD comp looking a lot easier to navigate. Now it is going to come down to their solo laners to see how much damage they're actually going to bring to solos. That's a bard pick for Nile. Yeah, I heard you were talking about this before, about Nile being a bard player, and I was pretty excited when you told me the prospect that a bard might just get picked, and I'm really happy to see it. <laughs> I'm pretty excited as well. It's it's. I think it's Bobby over on the other side basically one tricks this champion in uh, in solo queue. But unfortunately, Bobby's stuck on jungle duty at the moment because they don't have any other junglers on that side. So uh, I mean, look, it's still a takeaway. But yeah, Nile has played Bard once already in this tournament. Looked pretty good on it when it happened, and it's just a fun champion to watch. We get to just sit here peacefully, listen to some Ute's. Uh, as I mean, the Heimerdinger band. Look. I don't know if that hybrid dinger was doing enough to warrant a bad last game. <laughs> well, to be fair, if you were doing so well in the last game before, you might as well just take the two picks that may have felt comfortable to the other laners, like yeah. Mordekaiser right now. <laughs> yeah, no, fair enough. Uh, I don't think this is going to be a huge problem for Sub Doodly. The Shen is still available. It's, it's shocking to me that they didn't go for that in the last game, and I'll be shocked if they don't go for it in this game as well. It's still on the table. It I fits mean, the comp it's so well. Good. It's just good. Shen is just a good champion as well. Like, you do well in the sideline. Like, there's very few matchups that just smash you. Other than Gangplank, and honestly, I'm not entirely sure that Misha will play the Gangplank well enough to completely destroy Sub Doodly on it. Um, so, I mean, I like, just, just pick Shen. If it's not picked here by Misha, who could pick it away? I mean, this is a good pick, and you could recognize that that's a strong champion that your opponents might want to pick up. But, I mean, Shen does fine in set. I think you just pick Shen here. <laughs> Whether they do is maybe another story, but good. they are hovering it, good. and it's gonna okay. be locked. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just a good pick, and like it, it is. Globals are just hard for people to deal with uh, a lot of the time in play, where you're not used to playing with people who are playing well organized around the Shen. The one thing I do want to see is aggressive Shen ults, You know, looking towards this bot lane with the Sejuani with the Nautilus, it's super easy to set up ganks with Shen ult on top of it, and with Akali as well. You just dive into that backline invisible, and all of a sudden there's a Shen and an Akali wrecking your entire team from the from behind. I'm really liking both of these team comps so far. They seem really mm. nicely team fight oriented and they really have their strengths and weaknesses. Ooh. Oh, wow. Kennen. Okay. Is that mid lane? I think that's probably going to be Kennen top into the Shen now and then set mid, right? Set mid into Akali, though. Is that not bad? 
I don't know about that one. Maybe. Look, I don't know matchups. What are, what are we doing on this desk? <laughs> um, I think it's probably okay. It's it's. I, I can't imagine the Akali does enough kind of early chip damage to actually force Set out of lane like very early, right? So Set probably does okay early on. And after that, he just starts to build a little bit tanker, bruisery, and gives you a bit of a front line. And then the cannon, the cannon pick, I'm not entirely sure about right here because the, there's not an easy way for this cannon to just burst out multiple members of the enemy team. Again, the Ezreal is an AD carry who builds a bit tanky, who actually does have good escape tools as well. And with a Shen there, with an Akali who can dodge out of a lot of cannon's uh, abilities as well, this cannon is going to struggle to find good flanks in this game to actually do things. So maybe they're playing a little bit risky in this last pick. I do think it works to be here for the team because they have the lockup of cannon ulti into bard ulti and then you can just drop one of them with the showstopper straight into your team i think it fits so well and they're both really nice team fighting comps that's true like maynut's team sure right if we look at it <laughs> maynut's team if the dream comes off okay you get the five man bard ult you get the five man cannon ult because you're just standing there waiting for them to come out of bard ult and then sets just like drops one of them on top of the rest of them at the same time and, i don't know you've got a graze ult and a sen ult thrown in there on top as well sure the enemy team no longer exists on Summoner's Rift and probably won't come back even after their death timers are over because they've just been that utterly destroyed. <laughs> but when you look at the team comp that's been drafted on the other side, the amount of times these champions are just going to want to be standing on top of each other as five and just waiting for that to happen seems super low. You know, the Sejuani is going to be posturing forward. Nautilus is maybe back behind Ezreal, but Ezreal is able to jump out of a lot of things with that arcane shift. And the Akalia wants to be off on the side looking for flanks. And Chen is probably off on the sideline while all of this is happening, just split pushing away with Sanji United up. So while they need to comp is there and the team fight is there, getting their opponents to just fully opt into getting hit by all of those abilities is... Uh, Maybe optimistic, but hey, I said the same thing about TED in the last game. I said all they needed to do was, you know, not opt into those fights uh, or not opt into the skirmishes, and they were just fully on board for letting Maynut do whatever they wanted. So maybe this game we just see them standing there in the 5v5, ready to get hit by all these AoE abilities. Yeah, it should be interesting either way. I do like that there is a lot of appeal for the Akali, which you might not need it as much, but a lot of appeal for the Ezreal, because if Ezreal mm -hmm. gets locked down by something like a Bard ultimate, even if you don't get the five-man ulti, and even if you don't get the five-man cannon ult, locking that Ezreal down is so huge for Maynus, since that's probably most of their damage bar Akali. So it's nice that they have something to really keep that Ezreal alive with the Sejuani ulti, with the knockback, with the Nautilus ulti, with Shen ulti even. It's it's just a very nicely yeah. simple comp to execute. The only like pressure I'd say is when to hit the Shen ulti and Ezreal needs to stay alive. That's it. I think simplicity is the name of the game for TUD. They went for a bit of a weird comp last game. It was going to be tough for them to execute on. They needed to be playing front to back team fights uh, with champions that are probably... Yeah, you know, like the the parts were there, but they're very rarely put together in that way. So it was going to be tough for them. Whereas this is just everyone's played with Sejuani, everyone's played with Nautilus and Ezreal and Shen and Akali at this point, right? You know, you know how these champions work, you know how they fit together. And so for TUD, you, I think you you nailed it there. It's going to be a little bit simpler for them to execute in this game. Yeah, I think that's the name of the game because like my news. Perfect Anomaly's played a few tournaments before community ones, and like a couple of these players I've seen play before, so they know what they're doing. Yeah, it's this TUD team. Yes, they they seem to be struggling a bit. Maybe that's just a bit jitters. Playing a simpler comp to execute and something that, you know, there is just a right way to play it is probably just a lot handier for them and probably just eases them a bit more, especially after dropping that first game. It will. I mean, if we want to look at the tournament as a whole, this TUD squad did have three wins coming into tonight's game. They managed to take a game off their sister team uh, at TUD and then Maynooth have only won two of their games coming in. They actually went 0-2 in week one. So Maynooth getting a couple of wins here will feel really good for them. It'll actually leapfrog them up ahead of TUD in the standings. But TUD tying this one up means that they managed to just squeak it out ahead of Maynooth. They'll stay that little bit ahead. So this game, there's a lot riding on this game for standings. And beating the teams that are around you in a tournament can mean so much when you're kind of on pace with them in the tournament. Yeah, and I think both these comps are just perfect anyway for what they're trying to do, and it's easy to watch anyway. So I just hope to God that his field doesn't E into the whole team. <laughs> that's, that's basically all that's going to spoil this if it does happen. And Small spoilers, uh, it is going to be Ken in mid lane. I'm looking at the client right now. It's a set top lane into the Shen. That's fine, whatever. That's Everyone's seen Shen set at some point in their lives. But Ken and Akali in the mid lane is going to be a little bit of a spicy one. I mean, if Akali goes low, Shroud's not going to save you. Ken comes in and sits on you with ultimate anyway. So I'm excited to see how that one plays out. And I hope everyone at home is as well. We're going to head again to a quick three minute break as we wait for this game to load in. And don't go anywhere, because this should be a spicy game, too.
And we're back on the rift for game two of this best of two in the League of Legends Winter with Irish Collegiate Esports. With me here is Nualeok. After a really strong game performance from Maynooth, they are going into game two and hopefully looking for the 2-0. Nualeok, what do you think of the comps this time? Ooh, I think the comps are definitely more equipped to deal with each other on a more equal basis. Both of these comps are much happier skirmishing than they were in game number one, where in game number one, TED Apes' comp was really not built for mid-game skirmishes. This time around, they can try and take it to Main Youth University. I mean, they tried in game number one, but, you know, they really shouldn't have. <laughs> this time around, we're going to have a go at it. Uh, as we've got fancy vision toggling, we know that Main Nooth do not know the TUD apes are here. How long are they going to sit here? How patient are they? They're going in for it. Legendary leading the charge. Let's go, boys. Yeah, Matt goes Vlad and Deviant are just going to hover in mid lane. Meanwhile, the rest of TUD apes going to get that deep ward in the blue, so they're not going to opt to get a kill. That's okay. Deep ward, they'll know where the jungler is starting. They know Clinto's on top side, but Clinto seeing that going in, the fact that Niall saw everyone walking in means that Clinto has vision as well. And Clinto may just choose to start on the blue buff of his own here. On, on, sorry, on Summoner Bobby's blue buff. This is, this is ballsy by Clinto. Yeah, pretty aggressive jungling. I think he thinks because he's playing Graves and Sejuani, he can just probably just take the early camps and probably punish if he does come in pre-level three. Possibly. He's gonna get found. He will be found, and this was a good call to get Sup Doodly to check this blue buff and potentially can force Clinto off this one. There's got a lot of damage that Chen can do at level one with just this Q. Yeah, and he's gone a bit forward here. Sup Doodly just trying to get a little something down here, and I guess the blue buff just end up going over to Clinto. Does force the smite out of Clinto though, and that'll slow down his subsequent cramps a little bit. Uh, but that's okay. And so this is good by Summoner Bobby reading this. Clinto's gonna run straight to his own blue buff. The collapse is here from the bot lane of MU. This could be really bad for Summoner Bobby. Yeah, Summoner Bobby caught between the remaining members of Maynooth here as Graves is going to come in here. Oh. Summoner Bobby taking quite low, is going to get rooted, and the Q going to pick up the kill here. First blood going over to Clinto. In all level ones, there are winners and there are losers, and the clear winner this time around is Maynooth as the bot lane gets the early push. They're aware that Summoner Bobby might come into their jungle. And Cenobard control the early lane, walk up first. Clinto comes straight over from the TUD blue buff, and they get an easy first blood. And this is so bad now for Summoner Bobby. Not only is he going to be behind, he's now he's getting his Raptor stolen. He's probably going to get three buffed by Clinto. And if you thought there was a jungle diff last game, wait until you see this game. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's a bit unlucky right now. Menuth already off to a first blood start, and especially that first kill going over to your jungler means you can just get a jungle item a bit earlier and really power farm the next couple of camps. Oh, this is going to be so rough. <laughs> I'm yeah. so scared of this Graves already. <laughs> Three minutes in and I'm po this Graves is poised to take over the game. And honestly, it's not looking much better in any of these other lanes as well. The Shen is getting pushed in, has been hit by a couple of big haymakers from Seth. I have a full grit. The bot lane is getting hard pushed in. This Akali is just getting absolutely shoved in by the cannon as well. Low health bars almost across the board for TUD. And it's honestly looking even rougher than it did at the start of game number one. I'm really liking out of all this though that the normally did opt to go for the call because I think he knew he was going to be pushing them in and getting that like extra bit of farm from the early laning phase. So getting that like extra bit of gold value out of it is just so nice. <laughs> oh, it's so greedy and it's working out so well as we see a little bit of a mistake there. Soft Doodly, you need to... Oh, if he's okay. You need to hold onto that ref uh, Spirit's Refuge, the Shen W that blocks auto attacks until you're being attacked by the set's Haymaker, or by the set's Q. And you saw it didn't happen there. There was a huge amount of damage coming out. Is this oh, going to be Matt Vlad and Troll? Really nice stun from Deviant. Okay. Does force the flash, but the Ignite does come down from Matt plus Vlad. Maybe a bit oh, over ambitious, well. but Clinto going forward here, putting the flash, going to smoke screen Matt plus Vlad. Maybe he gets it with the second auto. Does have the E available, oh. but he doesn't even need it. Meanwhile, Misha in the top lane, forced to flash out of Sub Doodly. Okay, that's that's good for Sub Doodly up in this top lane, but obviously, it's not good for Madko's Blad in the mid lane. Uh, Clinto is just popping off already, chasing down the Akali with red buff, and Summoner Bobby just kind of took the long way around to support the Akali, a little bit afraid of the cannon, who just flashed out. There was really no threat there, and I think that's a little bit of a misplay by Summoner Bobby, maybe feeling the heat of how this early game has gone. Uh, uh -oh. oh, and the Haymaker and the W go to pick up the kill for Misha. Yeah, uh, this Shen not having a good time. I said it was not a particularly set favorite matchup, but Misha is definitely making it look like one. It, 
it can be rough second push in the early lane but this this is probably something that shouldn't be happening just straight up one more. Maybe a bit overextended from Perfect Anomaly. The W auto going to connect as the Ignite does come down from Legend Jerry. Anomaly only has a flash available to him. But I Grenado going to go down pretty low here from Nile. The Ignite forced TP going to come out here from, I believe, Misha, who is going to come in. Doesn't have the ulti available to him. Are they going to terror dive? No, they're not. And I guess they're just going to waste the TP. Mm, it's absolutely a little, little bit of time to farm this, but Shen struggles pushing the wave all the way to Terror early on. Clinto up there means that he'll probably just get to pick up a fat wave, so even though it looks like a bit of a waste of TP from Misha, his bot lane probably wasn't under all that much threat of dying. In fact, I think it was probably Legendary was under, or Icornetto was under the most threat of dying. All that this has really meant is that Clinto gets lane, lane farm, and it just means Clinto is getting even farther ahead of Summer Bobby in this matchup, and it's just looking like Clinto. It's just going to dominate this game. There's going to be dragon control again for Clinto. We saw how hard he punished that in game number one. And honestly, I'm feeling bad if I'm anyone who's playing against this Graves right now. Yeah, Clinto going to get his first recall now. Be interested to see what he gets. Hasn't quite gone back yet. Yeah, and he's going to go for nearly okay. the complete jungle item with boots. Oh, I mean, it's just rough. Six minutes into the game, he's got the Caulfield Wall Hammer, he's got the boots. Probably heading straight down towards this dragon. We'll see if he even bothers to stop and try and pick up more camps on the way because this could just be a very early first strike. It was a 24 minute soul in the last game, and they could try and speed run their way to the same thing again. Yeah, I don't really think there's anyone who can contest them. That was Vlad. I think the closest one to getting six so far, but either way, I think the only person who can probably help a bit here is Doodly, and I think yeah. he's getting pushed out a bit hard in top lane. You can see both both teams not really aware of where their opposition are at the moment. They will find a Sejuani if Sumner Bobby chooses to come mid lane after this. Clinto has time to go for this Drake right now, but they're not entirely sure where the Sejuani is. And so they're being a little bit hesitant right now, but they will go for it now. They know that the blue will spawn on that top side. On that top side. They figure Sumner Bobby will be up there. So this is going to be an early first Drake again, and Icornetto is under threat. Does have the flash available, though. The only summoner left from the bot lane. <laughs> Goes flat. This Akali is getting a little bit bullied in the mid lane. This kind of this is the you know the advantages of range versus melee. This is why top laners hate their lives when these matchups are picked, and it's not because they're fun for the melee champion. Kind of ironic here that a man who's mad because he can't play Vlad is not having a fun time because he's not playing Vlad. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think the hope for Mad because Vlad is that the opponents are mad because he's playing Vlad. But yeah, I mean, it's not looking good. It's this is just Oh my god, god, the slicing <laughs> Maelstrom. Gonna do some serious damage, forcing the Stan United from the champ. But they do come in with the first season. And they do pick up the kill out to Deviant. Oh my god, Mad because Vlad is a smurf. <laughs> Alright, no, no, no. He just, he's just actually insane. He's, he's just insane. Mad. He's smurfing on him. That was incredible. <laughs> that was absolutely beautiful. Well played by Mad because Vlad. The channel coming up clutch. I mean, even I'd honestly forgotten that there was a Shadow in this game. I was so focused on the 1v1 in the top lane that I was like, oh yeah, Shadow Ult exists, and United comes through, that's a shield. And I mean, just so well played by Mad Cuz Vlad. And anything we were saying about this lane being rough, as this Akali gets a kill, will start to look good as that gen damage. I mean, look, this is this is why he does fine in most 1v1 matchups. Wow, I wasn't aware that Caps uh -oh. was playing on Akali, but we uh -oh. do see Legendary uh -oh. gonna go down at the end here. Hey, don't miss, don't miss Nautilus hooks when your opponents are standing in front of walls. You're gonna have a real bad time. Yeah, that was a bit unfortunate as Legendary gonna go down to leave that Ezreal by himself. And he did opt for the tier start as well, which mm. I can kind of understand since he just wants to sit back and stack it, but not having this pickaxe means he's so susceptible to getting killed right now and getting poked heavy. That's, I, I, that's exactly it. I think with how this, this lane had been going already, the, the pressure they've been under, how skirmish heavy it had been, you can absolutely just go for that pickaxe and try and skirmish a little bit harder. Especially because Glinto's getting ahead, you know, at least give yourself a chance to fight back if he decides to look bot lane. And that tier start is, you just kind of sack the lane at that point, you know, it's easy for them to come and do it. And now someone or Bobby is caught <laughs> on the wrong side of this. Niall did miss the explosive plant, but that didn't matter because I think the kill is going to go over and I don't think, yeah, Anomaly didn't get the assist on it, unfortunately. Nah, Clinto, that's all for Clinto. He had to take it because if he'd waited for Anomaly to get the assist, Anomaly was getting the kill there. And you don't want that if you're Clinto. You want all these kills. Because you're that the is carry. True. It's important to remember that you're the AD carry from the jungle for this team. That's true. Who needs an AD carry when you have a Graves? <laughs> when you have a 3-0 Graves. Ooh, take a bit oh, of the slicing Maelstrom gonna stun the Akali, who is gonna be taken quite low. Yeah, and again, Matos Lad just surviving a little bit. Shen wasn't available this time, but Matos Lad showing it pretty well. Uh, forcing that off, not letting him get much damage down on this tower. Summoner Bobby is mid lane. They could look for a turn around here. That was a missed Sejuani ult we just didn't see off the camera. And that's a little bit unfortunate for them. That could have been the turn around. That, if that Akali, if that stun had gone down, if Akali picks up one or two more kills there, it's huge. 
Yeah, no Glacial Prison up means he can't really do anything bot lane right now, and Perfect Anomaly Nile can probably just push Ooh. this in as hard as they can. Really nice, he done the W, gonna connect onto the Ezreal. Lovely W from Perfect Anomaly. Hook going to miss, and <laughs> Legend Jerry might be a bit low here. Tempered Fate not gonna connect onto Summoner Bobby, and Anomaly forced to flash out, does the heal, and Legend Jerry picks himself up a kill, and I think Nile goes down as well. Nile should go down here. <laughs> Two kills in response. That was pretty clean. You have to be aware the Bard Burst is there when he has a Meep and the Q is available. There's quite a lot of damage that can come out of the Bard, but Icorn out on not going down was forced to blow the heal, and that's pretty big. It's two kills in response, as you say. The big unfortunate part of that is Icornetto doesn't get either of them. And you really want to start getting kills on this Ezreal because again, Icornetto is one of the big, one of the only real damage threats on this team. They've got three tanks and a Kali and an Ezreal. So Ezreal is the sustained damage. And if Ezreal is too far behind the curve, then you're just not going to be able to chop through the set. You're going to have a little bit of a struggle actually managing to take people down through the heels of the Senna in these fights as well. And so you want these kills on the Ezreal. That's what it boils down to here. And hopefully if we see them again in that bot lane, we will see them as uh, it looks like in the top lane. So clearly he's finally got that Spirit's Refuge time down. He's blocking the auto attacks that matter. Uh, and he, he's doing okay in these trades now that he's got a little armor and health. Serious amount of damage coming through here, but Subduity getting a little bit back in response is Misha at about half HP. No one's around to help. And I think this is going to be a big old noodle fight. Yeah, I, Sub Doodly kind of wins the fight from there, but of course, Set's sustain is so strong that Set will just, yeah, I, you can see it. He's already back up to three quarters health, despite being lower than the Shen. And you have to be oh. careful because as soon as you try to all in this Set, he'll get his grid up. He'll try to burst you down with the Haymaker, and Sub Doodly giving him a little bit of respect because of that. Pretty incredible damage. Most gold in the game so far, of course, sitting on Clint, but Perfect Anomaly. What, 10 gold behind him? He's doing serious bits. Yeah, not too bad. I mean, that's the 30 CS lead that he has over his lane opponent at the moment. And again, that's the risk of Tier Ezreal. You are just giving up the lane to your opponent and letting them do whatever they want. It's two Terra Plates gone down. With that, Perfect Anomaly will actually overtake the three kill Graves in how much gold he's got in, got in the bank. Uh, and as you say, this Senna doing well. Uh, this is definitely not the fasting Senna that we used to see. This is a Senna who's out for blood, has already finished that cull as well that's contributing to the gold. And... Depending on how far away we are from that Mura Mana, this Senna is going to look really strong in the next kind of four or five minutes. Senna's pretty much Ezreal but better right now since she does have the serrated Dirk oh, and the finish. Only 120 out of 750 mana. We're a while away as this Dragonflight might kick off. Ah, uh, we do see a lot of damage here. Mako's bad, going to go into Deviant, who's forced to ulti, doesn't have the flash. So the rest of the menu squad here, trying to do something to do get Legend Jerry, but Blue Team pick up the Dragon, and there's going to be a fight coming out here. Glacier Prison going to hit Clinto, who is super low, but the teleport is going to come through here for Misha. Mako's bad, taking super low, is going to go down, and that's going to be two kills over to Maynus. Icornetto forced to E out, and overall, that's one Dragon for TUD, and two kills for Maynus. Okay, uh, I mean, it's the first Dragon of the series. For, for TED. Uh, they didn't pick up a single one in the last game, gave up solo 24 minutes. So that's, I still hesitate to call it a win <laughs> because they did, did give up two kills. They're gonna give a bot there. There's gonna be even more gold onto this Senna, but I mean, it's at least signs of life for them. They're contesting for things in this mid game. Uh, unfortunately, Mad because Vlad got abandoned a little bit on the back of the fight. His team just took the dragon, Legendary went down and they were like, nah, we're out of here, pal, peace. Uh, Hopefully we see a little bit more cohesion out of them in these dragon fights as the game goes on, but at least they're trying things. It's kind of unfortunate because Michael's Vlad could do some serious bits in that fight if he'd only had that uh, Hextech Gunblade completed. Such a huge spike for Kali, and I reckon if he had it, he may, may have been able to do something a bit different. It's just a bit unlucky sure. he didn't have the heal and the active. Yeah, it, it's rough, and this Kali is not having a good time. And Akali does also, you, you, you need your team on the other side of the fight distracting people. You still can't 1v5 unless you're very, very fed. So Madkus Vlad needs the rest of his team to step up a little bit in these fights. Uh, if they are kind of, you know, 5 v 5 or 4 v 4 If it's just off in the jungle he's skirmishing, he can still definitely pick someone off. This Kali is still a threat, and if you take your eyes off her for just a second, Madkus Vlad will have just assassinated this Ken and killed off the Senna in the blink of an eye. We do see the cannon hovering around their top side as the next repair will going to spawn in two minutes. Going to be an ocean soul for this game for another two heal heavy teams. Hmm. I think worth pointing out as well, I believe Sup Doodly might have tried to use the Shenult on Legend Jerry in that last fight. Uh, it's on cooldown at the moment, so that's going to be gone for a little while longer. And 
something I talked about in champ select, and I talk about it basically anytime I ever see Shen picked, is I love proactive Shen. I just want to see teams use Shen aggressively because it's such a good tool for ganking. Your Sejuani comes out of the fog of war and knocks someone up and all of a sudden there's Shen there for the follow-up CC and honestly quite a lot of burst as well. And it's something not a lot of teams do very effectively. Uh, they, they're they trying to use the Shen reactively in fights instead of getting it in early. And it's just, you're missing out on having the fifth member there for much longer than you potentially could have. It's a bit unfortunate as well right now because Perfect Anomaly and Niall have already swapped top lane looking for this tier one turret, but DAT have T or T Dublin haven't responded to recalling their bot lane and send them top lane into this, and Sub Doodly is just getting poked out. Yeah, and into bot lane, Misha is just keeping like Cornetto at bay. The set versus Ezreal. I mean, you think the Ezreal should be poking out the set, but that's not how it's happening. He should just play in all the way forward in that lane. And I mean, potentially too far forward, but they're doing a good job of tracking Summoner Bobby. D Ford and that bot side are keeping Misha safe. So the vision right now for uh, Maynooth is quite good and you can see it there for TUD they've not really got all that much up map it up I tell a lie they didn't even have vision of Summoner Bobby they're just they're just savants you know big brains tracking them through <laughs> fog of war uh you've heard of Phage and Tiamat but have you heard of Bilgewater Cutlass and <laughs> Phage a like, bit, bit indecisive we, there. Oh, we, yeah. we hit, okay. <laughs> just pick up the full bork. My mistake. <laughs> sure. yeah. I was going to say, we hit preseason if the item build path's changed and I hadn't heard about it yet. <laughs> but yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, no, ah. I mean, the, the bork is always the first. Uh, you know, when you're up against tanks for uh, a set, you do want that. I mean, it just gives you so much to cut through them. And three tanks on the other side means that right is... I think they should be fine getting out here. Legendary, I think, is just going to die on yeah. the tower again. Legendary gets W though. And the GC the Glacial Prison gets blown oh, as well no. for Summoner Bobby. Deviant Magical's Vad going to fight out here. It's the Slicing Maelstrom forcing the flash out of Magical's Vad. Mid fight, but Misha is in the brush and he is going to try and take oh. him out. But they do pick up Deviant in response. Deviant goes down and Magical's Vlad is huge in that. The reason I was screaming at that topside fight was perfect and not only missed the Zenult onto a, onto a target that was stunned. Sub Doodly is in a bit of trouble here. I don't think the Spirit's Refuge is available, so going to take a lot of damage from these multiple lady carries will escape with the flash at the end of it though and it is getting scrappy across the map this time around though we said it TUD Apes comp is built for these scraps and is happy to take them yeah and i think the flash gone from shen going to pretty unfortunate but it's better than him going down here and they aren't going to pick up the tier one turret top just yet anyway mm. rift herald is available oh that was an e you could see he was caught by that it by the seti but the arcane ship taking him out of danger rift herald is live see if either of these teams feels like they have enough control to go for it sub duty still needs to be oh. careful he could just get though gets hit by the w the tempered fate isn't available just yet but sub duty forcing the flash into nile ignite just oh, come no. through and now picks up the kill meanwhile in the jungle deviant gets ignited gets taken very low as three members of tud meet two members of minus misha flashing forward here with the w going to pull two in three members Here's of tud are around here to try and stop this that the tempered fate doesn't hit anything unfortunately Kali ultimate still on cooldown, Madkus Vlad not wanting to just dive in there without it. And Madkus Vlad might just be in trouble. Yeah, Madkus Vlad is getting stunned under turret in his little smoke screen. <laughs> and a lot of damage coming through from Misha, who did predict where he was going to be a bit there. And he does go down. Oh, he dies to the Q from Senna through the Sejuani. That's a feel bad moment. Misha oh! Perfect Anomaly, where are you going? <laughs> He's taking a quick recall to get his next item. <laughs> I mean, I think the even better part of that was Niall died to tower. He executed on the way to getting Perfect Anomaly that far into the base. So, <laughs> I mean, call it confidence. I think maybe maybe a hint of uh, a smacking of the end, sneaking into that tower dive. But Maynooth they're clearly feeling in control of this game. Even if they aren't feeling as far ahead, even if they aren't as dominant as they were in game number one, they're definitely feeling like they have the control. And honestly, looking at the gold lead, they are 7,000 gold up. Even if the scoreboard isn't as big on the kills, they've really controlled the map well. They've gotten farm onto the relevant carries and they look pretty strong in this game number two. Um, it's Clinton the jungle again. 50 CS up. Just look, it's so good. I also like the perfect anomaly opted to go for the edge of night first after of the lethality items because going for the edge of night here means he can block the potentially glacial prison, he can potentially block the taunt or whatever random it's like nice nautilus step chart that comes to them. It's a nice one to have. E even blocking one Akali ult out of fog of war, you know, it gives you a little bit more time to react when that burst comes if you are found out in the jungle. So yeah, uh, definitely nice. And I think a, a smart buy in this situation. And hey, 
it's lethality, you know, like it's you're not necessarily going to be running away from a Nautilus or a Sejuani if you go for the Yomi's Ghost Blade first with speed. So going for something that blocks those abilities instead is a, a, a decent choice right here. So keep an eye on that. We'll, we'll have to track it now. Now that we've talked so much up about it, we'll have to actually see if it does come in use for him at all in this game. And I mean, there's the individual gold leads across the board. It's a 7k gold lead overall. In the top lane, it's a 2k gold lead. It's another 2k in the jungle. It's one. Eh, it's only about 200 in the mid lane, and then it's 2.5k for the AD carry. And that is your gold lead. That is how far ahead they are. And it's gold on the people who matter. It's gold on the carries right now for Menu. Yeah, it's a bit unfortunate for TUD here because right now Baron's up, and they need to constantly make sure they keep vision of it because I have to say their comp's a bit better this time for taking Baron. Mm. Uh, but the other the other side of this now is that either of these teams now have good comps to punish Baron. Match of luck. Nearly got caught out there. But you see Misha forcing the fight onto Subduedly. Maybe get something out of there. As, oh, now, as oh, he oh. do get the ulti, Clint does pick him off. Which one of these champions is the assassin who's hiding in bushes in the jungle? Right now, it's the 502 Graves. Uh, that Clint, Clint on that Graves is looking huge, carrying two games uh, in this series. And just... Kind of putting the fear of God into the enemy team right now. Uh, we'll see if they have an answer for it. The one thing that you could look at if you are TUD apes right now is this. <laughs> is the Kenanul. Really doesn't do all that much damage. Ooh, As the Glacial Prison though, that does do a bit and Deviant forcing it with the Ezreal ulti, not going to connect. Dawning Shadow coming down here from the Senna. They do pick up the kill on Subdued. Misha going very far forward here, hopefully getting the kill onto Summoner Bobby. They do pick up Legendary while the rest of the members have shown up there. And I think TU Dublin on the retreat, two members down for one. <laughs> As fight looks like it's just going to fizzle out here at the end, see if the push continues forward. But that was exactly what I wanted to talk about. It was that cannon ult. It's the fact that this cannon is not one of the Fed members. That is the only real AP threat on the side of Maynute. So the three tanks on TUD apes can continue to stack armor, I think. And if they do do that, it's going to be so hard for Maynute to actually cut through them. And so there is a chance if we see a couple of more big armor items come through for TUD apes, if that's the direction they go, they can still contest these mid-game fights. Whoa, what a clean W from Perfect Anomaly onto Mag Lavad there. It was a nice stand United, but that was a really nice prediction W. Mm, fight's going to continue here. Both teams, it's these big tanks, it is hard to chop through. The armor is starting to come through. Ezreal has an Iceborne Gauntlet as well. There's a big Gauntlet. It's pumped all the way up to 10k since we last talked about it. But when you're a full AD team, even with two Black Levers, even with a bit of lethality, a few armor items have the potential to ruin your day, so... I don't know if TUD apes have enough gold to actually get there in time. I don't know if their tanks have recognized the opportunity, and if they've recognized... That is their only way, is hopefully kill the cannon off, and just hope that your full AD tank, or full armor tanks, can carry the rest of the fight. I think that's TUD apes' win condition from this point, and if they recognize that, maybe they have a chance, but it's still going to be a, a hit or miss thing. Yeah, and what you really don't want to see from TUD apes is the Akali getting caught and then forcing the Shen ulti onto her for pretty much no reason yeah. other than her overextending. Yeah. Again, like, I mean, that's it's the perfect Shen delivery system. I mean, you just have Akali jump into the back line, you get onto Perfect Anomaly, you get onto Clinto, and Shen arrives while the Akali is there. And if you're using the Shen ult defensively, you cannot do that. You cannot make aggressive plays to try and catch out one member and force a 5v4 out of nowhere. Uh, and so, I mean, that's, that's just... That's the reality of the situation, is these channels have all been forced to be reactive because they're behind us. Across the map! Oh! Yeah. As the Donning Shadow does connect into the Tempered Fate, and Niall, hopefully gonna yeah. get this one. <laughs> as he goes to try and get out there, nearly gets through! Some dude, he's gonna TP into this, and I think Maynews are trying to force a fight here. The remaining members of TUDH oh. are trying to come in here, but a really serious Ezreal ult he's gonna hit. Slicing Maelstrom, going to connect, went to going golden, means that a lot of damage comes through here for Maynews. Ezreal forced to retreat, but the collateral damage, gonna pick it up, Sub Doodly is pretty low, and so Summoner Bobby, who is going to go down, and Maynooth are going to probably take this dragon. <laughs> uh, damage just not quite there, and on the other side, just tanking is not quite there either for TUD. It looked like an okay fight for them. It was a big Shen taunt into a big Ezreal ult, and then all of a sudden the Graves is just running around shredding everyone, because he's now 8 on 4. There's two Black Leavers, and there's not enough armor on the tanks to stand up to this. Gold leads are huge. This Graves is over. 11,000 gold. It's disgusting. Clinto has now put his team back onto Soul Point for Ocean. I don't even think we're going to get there. I think this game ends before it. May News are just looking so strong. I honestly, after that fight, don't think there's a way that uh, TUD Apes can win a fight anymore in this game. 3k difference on the AD carry alone.
That is insane. It's filled. It's filled. And it's it's the problem again is we talked about this a little bit. Once again, iCornetto is basically one of two big damage threats on this team. It's Mad Cuz Vlad and iCornetto. And when you're one of your two damage threats is 4,000 gold behind on his just direct opponent. And even then, that isn't even the most gold on the enemy team. There's another 1,000 gold on top of that on another carry. I mean, you just don't have the damage compared to the other team and your tanks don't have the tankiness and you're just going to get run down in these fights. This is going to be probably the last fight of the game. This and run on. down it is. I mean, they're going to force you the True Shot Barrage going to connect onto Perfect Anomaly, but not going to do enough here. Glacial Prison going to hit Misha. Taunt through into the Manuth backline. The team's getting quite low here, but Misha does ulti Legendary out. Two kills going over so far from Manuth, but they do pick up Anomaly. And Misha is kind of on his own here as the rest of Manuth are coming around to try and pick it up. Double kill here for Deviant. Sub Doodly going to be the last member alive. And that's probably going to be the Baron and potentially a bit more. It was all eyes on Icornetto there. Jumped into the blue blue pit. Arcane shifted forward and assassinated Perfect Anomaly. Was a bit annoyed that we were giving all the praise over to this Senna, even though Icornetto has been doing work to try and keep his team in the game. But I mean, that's it. It was the one kill that went over. It's only Sub Doodly that survives. This Shen is getting chased down by the pirates, so there's not even a chance of the Miracle Steel coming in. And these are just how these fights are going to go, I think, until the game ends. There's, there's really no more way to look in. Even if you try to get the perfect fight off, you just don't have the damage to force your way through the tankiness of the Graves, of the Cannon when he presses E, of the Set, of the Senna heals. And on the other side, nobody, nobody is strong enough to stand up to the damage that's being pumped out by Mene right now. I'm pretty sure before that fight happened, Perfect Anomaly... It would, would have had a shutdown as well. Every member of Minute has a shutdown. Then that is, that was yeah. nuts. Yeah, uh, I mean they they are just that far ahead, and it's it's. It, there's not much more to say at this point. It is just it looks over to me. I'm just waiting for Minute to actually you know group of five and just force something because they're strong enough to. And I, like I guess the only way they lose is they go for side lane plays. But it seems like even the side lane like plays right now. Oh, what a snipe from the dawning shadow onto the. But the Akali, which I think saved his life. Clinto flashing away here, trying to Look stay alive. <laughs> They're just getting in it for this. Clint is 1v4. He 1v4, I guess, plus the Senult in this bot lane. And this team is just ending the game. Clint's just going to stop recalls. It's over. It's like the game ends here. No, Clint's going to pick himself up with a triple kill. A Summoner Bobby and Legend Jerry going to try and force a fight here. <laughs> Baron and Parrot Minions doing bits. Smokescreen coming through here. Might slow them enough. And Bike Grenado getting 1v1 by the Bard. Oh! Oh! <laughs> we got it! Uh, it's all falling apart. The wheels have come off the bus. D.U.D. Where did it all go wrong? Bart's coming <laughs> in for the Bart's coming in for his kill! <laughs> this is Niall Penta. Oh, this stole. is it. Clint stole this is Clint peak stole League of Legends looks like. When the Bard yeah. absolutely water shots. And it comes from ICE. It's just Maynooth. They've looked so clean in both these games. I definitely didn't come in thinking it was going to be this one side of Maynooth. I mean, they've just played it better and they've played around Clint. I think that's been the backbone of this team in both these games. This Graves has been absolutely massive. massive. Finishes game to 10 0 5. Kind of got a gift to him with level 1, but hey, you still have to play it out from there. Yeah, and I guess it was very unfortunate for the TU D Apes team, but Maynooth just really didn't take the brakes, push the brakes in the just kept that accelerator down and ran it straight Ooh. for the Nexus. Ran straight for the Nexus, uh, and made it all the way there. Uh, I think game time was slightly longer than game number one. Uh, or about the same. I'm not I, I'm not actually sure. I should have written down what game number one time was. But hey, casting is hard. I don't know what I'm doing here. <laughs> Uh, GG well played. Maynooth just looked like the better team on the Rift. They just won early game skirmishes. And as you said, after that, didn't take the foot off the gas. Just continued to win skirmishes, stacked up dragons, uh, got to that ocean soul and won the game. Yeah, um, well played for the boys. Yeah, well played. GG. I think that's going to be us wrapping it up quite shortly. Of course, this has been ICE Winter. Uh, this has been Thursday, which means that there's 